Good afternoon, everybody, and um, welcome to session three, Technology Innovations. And what I'm sure is going to be really an exciting look um, at the way technology is going to shape our industry in the future. Moderating this session today is Mr. David Peake. David is Chairman of Asia Pacific for Universe Limited, which is the leading internet-based insurance service. He's got 30 years global career combining risk management, information technology and financial services, specializing in the insurance sector. David is regarded as an innovator, applying his experience to the industry in the terms of micro-insurance and emerging markets, medical tourism, multi-channel distribution with an emphasis on cell phone technology, global online trading and insurance risk, and increasing involvement in reinsurance uh, re capital. David is also the Asia Pacific Ambassador for the International Insurance Society in New York and has published many articles and papers in his career. So, as you can see, we're in very good hands to, uh, to manage this session this afternoon. So, without further ado, please welcome to the stage David Peace. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's very nice to uh, participate in this uh, in this conference. Um, I'm not from the tourism industry. I'm from the insurance industry, but we uh, we share we share similar uh, uh, similar risks. What I'm uh, going to do is I just I was asked to sum up some of the things that have gone on in the last couple of days related to what we're talking about, and then I'll introduce our eminent panel. Uh, and uh, Fritz will give you a presentation and then we'll go into a discussion. Um, one, I think the mission of today uh, for PATA is for us to try and take, uh, translate futures thinking uh, into insight and into uh, some kind of strategy and action. And uh, I think that when one's doing that kind of thing, if you envisage a tourism uh, bubble surrounded by marketing, surrounded by a strategic forefield, uh, you then get about nine different issues which all came out at this conference, uh, from environment to political to economic to legal. Uh, uh, there's about nine of those things. Uh, but today we're going to cover the, uh, the technology one that comes out of that, uh, come out of that strategy. Um, Eric Hoffer, um, a prolific author, once said, uh, that uh, in times of drastic change, the uh, learned inherit the earth. Um, the learners inherit the earth and the learned find themselves in a world that no longer exists. And certainly there is a book out by a guy called Jonathan Detrain, it's called The Future of the Internet and How to Stop It, which says that change comes from within organizations. It's not something that the board of directors uh, just directs downwards. It has to come from the whole organization. Uh, otherwise, uh, one might find oneself left behind. So I'm hoping that uh, listening to everyone speaking the last couple of days, that we can actually address um, maybe those two very interesting uh, points. So um, one of the um, things that uh, we need to look at is the mega trends. Uh, there are globalization is obviously one of those big trends. Uh, new customer preferences and um, you know the rise of internet and mobility and in Asia uh, I've got a chart that shows internet and mobility rising in America, uh, Europe uh, and other parts of the world and in Asia and in Asia uh, it's underpenetrated, uh, it's, it's uh, growing, uh, it's, uh, broadband's coming in, Wi-Fi's coming in and those charts are going through the roof and leaving behind those other markets as, uh, as saturated. So what I will, will want to do now is just to uh, introduce uh, our three panel members. Um, you've seen two of them already uh, in a previous uh, discussion this morning. So I won't read out the entire resume, so you have them in your, uh, in your folders, but first of all I'd like to introduce uh, Fritz Demopoulos. He's the Chief Executive Officer and co-founder of CUNAR. Now, QNAR is uh, a very successful online travel agent uh, in China, uh, and uh, Fritz also has quite a lot of experience in online gaming. So I, I think that online gaming could be a way that uh, uh, the 
the travel industry and the tourism industry could actually make a change to new customers by presenting some of their distribution uh, in the form of games. That's what we're doing in the insurance industry and I'm sure it might apply to tourism as well. So we'll, we'll explore uh, Fritz's uh, knowledge in, uh, in those two areas. Um, we also have Vincent Koch, who is the Chief Operating Officer for SOTA, which is a standard online <coughs> tourism and architecture platform. Uh, in fact, uh, this is a way of globally exchanging services between several partners in the tourism industry so that core confidence around the world can be brought in and shared amongst various members. So this is a, an excellent way of uh, collaboration and business network which was brought up this morning that uh, networking and collaboration is a number one um, milestone uh, and also probably going to be one of the most popular business models across all sectors in the next five years. So uh, we'll be talking to Vincent about that. And uh, last but not least, Dr. Matthew McDougall, uh, who is um, the Group Chief Executive Officer and Executive Chairman of Cyber Tech. <coughs> and um, his uh, core competence is around social networks. Uh, and after his discussion this morning, I think trust is a very big issue about social networks. So we'll, we'll explore that, uh, that way as well. So we'll try and cover uh, four major topics. We'll cover social networks, we'll cover mobile phone technology, uh, we'll cover rural tourism uh, and some of the issues around that, uh, and we'll look at new customer experiences, and we'll bring you in, hopefully, on, a, on an interactive discussion. So I will now keep quiet, and I will ask Fritz to make his uh, presentation.
emerging group buying, and it's a new way to buy products, and that obviously provides savings on the consumers. But what, what, what we're also seeing, not only with group, individual versus group buying, we're seeing open buying versus private sale. And some well-known companies such as Rue La La, Voyage Privé, um, VIP store here in China, as well as Shoka here in Hong Kong are just examples of companies where you can purchase travel products through a private sale model. For those of you that don't know, a private sale model is you have to be a member first. Is it hard to be a member? Probably not. It's pretty easy. However, uh, private sale opportunities are uh, can only happen through uh, through internet platforms. We're also seeing that the consumers now are able to obtain information and obtain, especially of opinions in different ways. It used to be we wanted to obtain information about Paris, we had to listen to the experts, whether they were paid journalists or possibly um, you know, um, expert Parisians. Now we can obtain information through what we call it peer reviews. TripAdvisor is the most well-known company. Here in China, we have Chunar, we have iGoYuga, which is owned by Saber. And these are all platforms that allow can, can, um, everyday consumers to actually post their opinions. So how we obtain opinions also changes, and information technology allows for that. Which platforms help us to obtain offers and information? It used to be we can only get, as, as consumers, we can only get information through people who sell products to us. Now, with information aggregators such as Baidu, Kayak, OAG, Google, Juno.com again, we're able to, consumers are able to have access to information independently from the seller, whether that's scheduled information, pricing, um, the roots, the brand name. And this again can only happen from the use of information technologies. <laughs> Where, where internet platforms have allowed independent search engines or independent media companies to actually um, su survive. And not only that, it used to be that the information we obtained at, at, um, with consumers had a certain level of a latency. Now everything is in real time. We can go through the internet and we can search hundreds of websites to find pricing information in real time and availability information in real time. Whereas before, we'd have to go to uh, a, a, an agent or a seller, we want to buy a product, and we have to wait to, to get confirmation that that product was actually available. Choices. How many choices do we have as consumers? It used to be there were a limited number of choices. Those choices were contingent on how much did that bricks and mortar or that traditional agent have to sell product. Now, uh, with with the use of Google and Baidu, OIG, and, and et cetera, consumers now can have unlimited choices of products um, and services of, of available. Just on, on, on Chunar alone, um, there are over 700 different sellers of, of products that, that consumers have real-time access um, of pricing and availability information. How we share information has also changed. It used to be, we as consumers, the only way we could share um, information is just through word of mouth, telling our friends, asking our friends, so that you like Paris. Now what we find is through social media, through microblogs, peer review sites, social networks, <coughs> social shopping sites, consumers now are, are, are able to obtain opinions and information um, about um, destinations, about the seller, about the quality of service, through a range of different channels not just from uh, consumers and media at the circle of friends, but from millions of other people. So we're moving from obtaining information from people we know to essentially everyone who's willing to, uh, who's, who's willing to write a blog or post a comment on a social media. <coughs> what type of information are, are we as consumers have access to now? Well, it used to be words and possibly pictures and brochures. Now, these consumers have access to all sorts of rich media companies like YouTube, Yoku here in China, and TV Trip specifically for the travel industry have provided consumers access to all sorts of rich media such as video, pictures, and, 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 and other multimedia content that allows consumer that, that allows us to make better decisions about, about where we want to travel to. And, and what type of information? It used to also be Unfortunately, the, it, was, it was the 
Walmart monetization or the or only the mass market products were available to us. Now with the internet, there's niches and there's super niches. Whether it's Wild China, Butterfield and Robinson, Mal Wright, Silicon Valley, or, or, or even Truffle Pig, all sorts of services, whether they are sellers of products or or other information intermediaries providing niche information to meet the requirements of a dramatically um, fragmenting demographic profile. We talked about this on the last panel as well, that um, sure, there's millions of Chinese, but millions of Indians and other people from around the world wanting to travel, but what we're seeing is a massive fragmentation of interests where, um, where we have a, a, a massive standard deviation of where consumers want to travel to, the type of travel products they want to buy. It isn't all the same. Everything's not black, everything's not vanilla. And also, whom you want to travel with. Now this is a little bit, Richard Quest asked us, so what's, so what's coming next? Today, I think most people still travel with people that we know. However, we believe in the future, through social networks, and whether some of those social networks are, are specific to travel or just general social networks, we may start traveling with you know, people that we should know that maybe we don't know already, people, uh, um, uh, fellow consumers who have similar interests. For example, if, if, if you're an art fan and you love Chinese food and you're sick of Paris but you want to go to southern France, you may be able to find other people just like yourself and you may want to uh, tour with them or, or, or at least obtain information. And so um, um, internet technologies, social media allow us to really find other types of people that maybe we should know that, that, that have a similar level of interest as, as we do. Of course, how we plan our trips. It used to be you just um, used an Excel sheet or a piece of paper, and now with all sorts of online planning tools such as Traxo, TripIt, and even Yahoo Travel, we as consumers have more power at our fingertips through online platforms to better, um, to, to better plan our trips. Clearly, I've just highlighted to you some examples of how information technology provides consumers, consumers just like all of us in this room, fantastic opportunities to travel better, to find better information, um, and eventually have better travel experiences. So thank you. Um, I'd like to kick this off with a question to Fritz, and I think uh, we can pass it on to the uh, other two panelists. Um, talking to people in the last couple of days, they're talking to me about the mindset of uh, traditional uh, operators and uh, travel agents, that they very much uh, see the uh, e-channel uh, as another channel, uh, and not necessarily a mainstream channel, or sometimes even a good one at that. So my, my question really is uh, sympathizing because I, I uh, work with a lot of insurance agents who, who really think the internet is not the way to go. Um, on uh, how does uh, QNAR think differently uh, for to be a successful company like you are from the traditional agent? And how do you avoid uh, channel conflicts, uh, especially in a nation market which is considered face-to-face -face by many people? Yeah, uh, David, that's a great question. Um, you know, I, I recently um, picked up on a, on a, on a funny story. Um, and I, in fact, I think I talked about television in the last panel. So I'm sorry, I'm always bringing up TV for some reason. But um, in, in, as soon as television, I think in the 50s, first started, um, they, 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 they asked us, some experts were asking people who own radio stations, so what do you think? And they used to, and, 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 one radio presenter said, well, isn't TV just radio with pictures? It's, it's, obviously, it's a lot more. Um, and online platforms are definitely a lot more than just blogging your own travel products. It's, um, in, in some of the examples that I just highlighted, um, 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 online platforms are, are, are not just a, you could say, a commerce vehicle for traditional agents. It, 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 it's a tool to help consumers make better decisions. It, it, it's a tool to help consumers find what they're looking for. In fact, 
to know and to meet needs that they never knew they had. And what we see is, 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 is the most successful online travel agents actually never had a uh, never had the backing of a traditional agent. And, and, and why is that? Because sometimes these disruptive platforms really require a, a new way of thinking and a, a, a new use of technology and a new use of business models. Me, um, me and my partners, we're actually not travel guys at all. Although um, our, our company is by far the largest travel website in China in terms of usage. We're with over 40 million customers per month. So, but, but we started out as travel experts. We came in as outsiders thinking about uh, the, the consumer internet and search and technology. Um, um, and, and so I, I, I think it's very important to, to be able to embrace change and technology and what we think is um, some of the uh, traditional agents have a challenge with that. Um, in, in, in terms of addressing channel conflict, um, it's clear from the point of view of um, airlines and hoteliers and, and the tour operators that following a multi-channel distribution strategy makes a lot of sense. Um, and from our point of view, um, every time you follow a multi-channel strategy, there will be conflict. Um, I, I, I think it's fundamental to know, okay, um, which channels have the, the greatest opportunity in the future versus which channels are your greatest opportunity today. And what we find is more and more online platforms are becoming the, becoming the prominent channel. Um, in fact, I, I think Azran probably over 90% of his business is actually done online already. And if we ask some of the guys from you know, Cafe Pacific, um, it's, 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 it's about 20, 25%. So, so, so certainly, the, I think the guys at Cafe are thinking, well, uh, traditional is important. We don't want to piss off the uh, traditional channels. Um, however, um, you know, Azran has taken a, a, a different approach, and clearly it's you know, been um, uh, very successful. So I think it's inevitable. It's all about managing your margins and, and, and really balancing future versus today. Maybe you can answer that, Vincent. Uh, uh, I'll ask you a question on you can bring your, what you're okay. doing into this. Sure. Um, when, when you're running your uh, your platform, your SOTA platform, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, you you really embrace the trend of globalization because you're going beyond borders and you're bringing services in from everywhere uh, so that you do truly get the best of the uh, breed uh, sort, sort of thing. Could you like to uh, expand on how valuable that can be for the PATA organization? Sure. Um, but let me answer that first part of the question. I think I, I like what you said earlier, that change comes from all levels, right? That's true, uh, because in, in what we do, we engage with a lot of travel agents. How many of you here are travel agents? Okay, so I'm only talking about two of you. The rest of you are not included, right? So <laughs> the rest of you can just close your ears now, right? Um, I hope I'm not talking about you, right? But we've got 1,400 users on our system, and. What Fritz said earlier is that there is a change of mindset. Uh, and that's very true because out of the 1004, I think we've only met a handful that has truly embraced internet are as the uh, main channel. The rest still think of probably very similar to what the radio man said, right? Uh, radio with pictures, right? So the internet for them, for a lot of these guys, is. It's an electronic medium for me to put up my brochure. And that's not what the internet is about, right? The internet is far more than that, because I think the internet gives us the opportunity to engage our customers on a very, very different level, right? So what used to be benchmark, and even for those who were on the internet early, um, where 48 hours response time was fantastic, it's not good enough. 24 hours is not good enough. It goes down to minutes. Uh, I, was, I had the opportunity to be we have Lutzi in Thailand on a panel, and uh, Lutzi Matzik was saying that uh, it's instant confirmation now. What people want are uh, instant response, right? So that's, that's how far the benchmark has moved from 48 hours or even a week, right, to instant, right? And that's, that's a whole change. Today, we, we, what we're doing is we're putting agents from all over the world. We've got users from 31 different countries, and what they do is each of them has special specialized niches. 
So through the platform, we're able to connect someone from Kuala Lumpur to someone in uh, Batam, from someone from Batam to someone in, let's say, in China, in Chengdu, right? And through this, you can actually arrange packages that go around the region, right? Not having met physically, but having met online, you're able to build a business, create new packages, new source of inventory, which was perhaps not available before. Do you like to take the agent question? There are also a different way because here at Pardo, we've got to try and think of what technology is changing our business, our industry today. And I think two things for me will represent that. I think one is my personal interest in social media. I think that's a platform like no other platform ever in history that has had a, 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 such an ability to change people's perception or people's intentions to purchase or people's intentions to travel. You know, like uh, Fritz was saying, TripAdvisor, for example, um, people review, if they have a bad review, they will change their buying decisions about where they stay. So that alone is one innovation in our industry that can't be ignored. The second innovation in our industry is the mobility, uh, the devices. So the access to information is in real time now. So tablets, mobile phones, are now the default mechanism of accessing my uh, information. So those two things, for me, when I think about technology innovations, for our industry, our part of members, would be key. Um, bringing it back to China. And like I said in the last panel, the greatest you know, the <coughs> folks in China, 62% of them access the internet via a uh, mobile device. Um, another statistic which is quite horrifying, the average Chinese netizen spends 19.2 hours a week online. Now that's mostly my staff, but the generally folks are online, they're connected, and there's a huge propensity to share particularly travel-related sharing. So when I go to, we talk about Paris for some reason, but when people travel to Paris, they come back, they share their photos, they share their videos, and they share their ideas and views. So the platforms are truly innovative, be it a device or be it a PC. This is an example, a real-life example. A friend of mine, he's a Malaysian, lives in Singapore. He bought a package to Bali, right, from a travel agent in Brunei. Okay. Right, it's truly globalized. <coughs> okay, uh, Matt, um, while we're on social networks, um, well, there's a lot of social networks and there's a great opportunity for the tourism industry to cross-sell and upsell through those, uh, through those networks. Um, the, the ultimate network might be the virtual world network where we are moving from a physical world to a virtual world. There is no doubt about that. Uh, in Hong Kong, we have an avatar university and uh, uh, young ladies of 15 buy their clothes off of the Second Life type of platform. Uh, how do you see um, that kind of social network uh, coming into the tourism industry? But I think, to be fair, I've seen the three-dimensional the virtual, the virtual world uh, modeling that was very in vogue in about 2006, 2005, where there's a lot of venture capital throwing money as, at those type of companies. When there was a downturn, those type of companies ran out of cash and found it difficult to refund. However, that aside, as a technology, you know, virtual reality provides a great window into to looking at destinations, into looking at hotels, into looking at airlines. So as a technology, it's, it's perfect. Uh, it's raw, it's young, but it's going to evolve. I and mean, certainly that would be a part of our experiential usage for, for tourism. Um, social media, on the other hand, and again, the point to be clear, is most of you have probably been touched by social media if you're not users yourself. Who's using social media today? Who's got Facebook or Twitter? Or, yeah, so, so a majority of people in this room today have some personal experience with that platform. The things to consider, and again, a lot of my clients are global, they might have a Facebook uh, campaign. You know, might, if you've got a hotel, you might have a nice Facebook page. you spent lots of time and effort. Unfortunately, if you're trying to attract the Chinese outbound tourists, they're not going to see it. So you need to consider the, the platforms that are being used uh, in the location of where you want a tourist. So very simple things. The types of messages that you use are very different. So for example, if I'm trying to reach um, the wealthy in China, there is different types of wealth in China. And just as a, a digression, 
three or four years ago, if I went onto a plane in first class in China, I would see a lot of bling. Everyone wore gold, everyone was very bright, and they showed it off. There is now, in a very short space of time, a sophistication. The people in first class now are wearing designer jeans and maybe a, a polo. The folks at the front of economy are wearing the bling and the, the fancy things. So very quickly in China, the demographics are fragmented. You can't, you know, we speak about having three levels. It's ridiculous. In Beijing, you've got 20 levels. So when you start looking at China, you've not got three demographic profiles throughout China, you've got 50. And those 50 aren't uh, linear, those 50 are regional and seasonal. So whenever you're doing social media strategies, consider your audience and consider the seasonality of that audience. Okay. Um, I think, uh, Fritz, maybe we could bring you a bit here on, uh, on the Gen Y issue because there was a big discussion just now on Generation Y and how they buy uh, from uh, and other generations, how they buy products, new consumer preferences. And obviously, uh, in the virtual world, which we've just discussed, children are immersed with headphones uh, into what they do. Now, in terms of uh, gaming, it all comes from gaming, uh, this might be a very interesting channel for uh, the tourism industry. If we could look at social networks from a gaming angle, distribution maybe. You know, um, the, the concept, we call it, you know, using game mechanics in all sorts of commerce um, platforms. Um, for, um, some of you may have used Foursquare. This is a well-known company that's using game mechanics in order to encourage consumers to actually use their product, although Foursquare itself is actually not a game platform. And we're seeing the same thing with group buying, for example, or, or flash sale products where we're seeing when, when the clock is ticking or, or that sand is, is um, glass, is, or, is there, the hourglass is, is actually a lowering. It's because of, of certain elements of, you can just, we call it um, game mechanics, which could imply a little bit of competitiveness, a, a, a little bit of that flea market sense that, you know, in Chinese, uh, tao jiao huan jiao, you know, uh, uh, the consumers really competing for something. And uh, what we feel um, is those elements across a raft of different commerce platforms, not only travel, by the way, but we're, 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 we're seeing it across many, many categories and subcategories. However, travel certainly resonates with that. And um, in, I think there's a reason why Zynga is very popular. And, and, and part of it is because it's a social platform, and part of it is because they've, they've utilized competitive game elements to encourage consumers to, to, to engage with that platform. And we do the same thing with our uh, so social shopping platform as, as well, encouraging consumers that they have to buy the last deal and it's going to run out in an hour, so maybe you better buy it now. Um, and uh, so we think those elements obviously resonate with, um, you could say, Generation Y, or maybe it's, gen I don't even know, it's probably Generation Z now, I don't know. It, it, it actually is true that, that if, if, if you walk on the street today in China, I mean, I think the likelihood of being run over by a BMW versus a crappy Charlie is, is, is actually the same. Meaning what, 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 what we're seeing is that the standard deviation is huge in China. And what does that mean? It means that fragmentation is massive. Everything from the bling squared to the really, really poor guys over here, or you, you could say the emerging classes, and everyone in between, and, and, and provinces are different. And what resonates with one group may not resonate with another. Um, however, that Generation Z or Y or XYZ, you know, that large subsection um, of, I think, about 50 million gamers in China. So there's 50 million gamers in China, which, um, so I'm in the internet business and Matt as well, and, and I think we have to be honest. Like, the game guys make all the money in China, and we don't make any money within the travel industry. I mean, let's be honest. And, and that is so huge. So if we can cream a bit of that for ourselves, I think it'll be great. And part of that is what Foursquare has done, what Zynga has done, is to utilize these game mechanics into how we um, merchandise our products and um, communicate those products to consumers. I have one more question, then we'll throw it open to the audience. Uh, what came up uh, yesterday was uh, rural tourism. 
Now, maybe I need a proper definition of rural tourism, but uh, being heavily involved in microfinance and microinsurance, uh, there are uh, a lot of people out there that are becoming uh, middle class over the next 10 years. Uh, they are the new audience. Uh, the, uh, the micro sector is, uh, I wouldn't say blossoming, but it's moving forward. So if we take now a question on rural, on rural tourism and try and combine it with mobility, social networks, uh, and the other things we've discussed, I, I'd like to hear the panel think about this uh, exciting new market. Okay, so, so look, I think the Chinese government are clearly embracing that whole notion of rural economies. So if you look at what's happened here in China, you'll see that high-speed bandwidth has been made available to the rural economies. You'll, you'll see the penetration of mobile devices, uh, the usage of PCs, all of that has been accommodated in the rural tier two, tier three cities. And I think that's a clear strategy of the Chinese government to enable that to occur. And through providing high-speed access devices that can you know, access the internet in a very uh, quick way, you're gonna get that natural uh, movement towards e-commerce transactions online and buying products such as travel online. Well, I come from Southeast Asia, so we don't have one government <clears throat> dictating policies for all 10 countries. So uh, it would be slightly different. So one, I think one of the challenges that we face in Southeast Asia is the availability of bandwidth or broadband capability uh, in the rural areas. But having said that, uh, there, are, there, there are attempts by many governments to address that. For example, um, home, home stays uh, in, in rural areas. That's, that's becoming an increasingly popular, popular kind of uh, product. And uh, <clears throat> what we're seeing is that these are potential niches for uh, operators to get into. And um, it could be fairly lucrative because home stays tend to be a, a lot longer than a city stay. Can you mention the halal market's opportunity for Oh, okay, right. We were just talking about halal market as well. And that's, and that's a huge market, right? Uh, I think uh, the, the BTTC had a section on that last year. And, you're estimating it to be an $18 billion market or more. I could be wrong. I mean, uh, just Malaysia alone, uh, the company manages Umbra, sorry, Hajj tourism in, in, in Malaysia has assets of 25 billion ringgit, which translates to 24, about 8 billion US dollars. Right. So that's how big it is. Thank you. Yeah. Fritz? I, I, I think I just want to add a couple of points. Um, we've seen when we first started our, our business in 2005, 95% of our consumers came from Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, Shenzhen. Those are the tier one cities. Um, and now, it's only 35% of our business. 65% are, are coming from all these other cities. Nanjing, Wuhan, tier two, three. In fact, um, P&G says there's six tiers of cities in China, um, all the way down to you know, some, little, you know, some, some little village. Um, and if, so, so, so we're seeing it's happening already. We're, we're seeing consumers are using the internet to look for travel products already. Maybe not sophisticated. Maybe they're buying packages as opposed to being independent travelers, but it's happening already. And, and I, would, I would like to add, um, if everyone's been here at the China World you know, shopping complex, you see all the fancy shops, Louis Vuitton, Chanel, all that sort of stuff. If, if, if you talk to the head of marketing of Chanel, in 2010, they did not open one shop in Beijing, Shanghai, or Guangzhou. But, the, but they opened 20 shops in China. They're all in tier two, tier three cities. Meaning, if, 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 if the fashion brands have recognized it, obviously travel is right behind that. It's, it's usually, number one, it's usually automotive. You know, people buy cars first. And then secondly, they start buying all the bling bling stuff, as Matt was talking about. And then they start traveling, right? And, and, and usually there's a pyramid there. And, this, so it's, it's happening already. If, if, if the fashion guys are in tier two, tier three cities, it, it's going to be the same for travel. And it's and, and we're seeing it, Sea Trip seeing it, a, a, a bunch of us. David, David, you were mentioning something about mobile coming into the play as well. Definitely. And, uh, <clears throat> I think uh, Fritz, you also talking about Foursquare. How many of you here are Foursquare users? Right. Do you check into Foursquare today? Right. If you look, if you go into Foursquare on your phone, whatever device you're using, you'll find that there are six deals near here, and the guy, and they are as far as 
10 miles away. I think these are the big topics of the great questions of our time that will help Pater if those things are addressed uh, from the mission statement that was given to me. So is there anyone who would like to venture a question in the audience? about the um, purchase of IPA by Google. Uh, what impact do you think that's going to make on the travel segment? Uh, uh, the uh, Google IPA acquisition. Um, yeah, uh, we think that in North America, uh, that's where um, IPA is very strong. And um, you know, uh, Google is a distribution company, and they're providing clicks and, and, and a marketing platform. And now they're controlling the back end. And, so I, th I think that might not bode well for some of the other um, vertical players that are competing with Google, such as uh, TravelZoo, TripAdvisor, Bing, Kayak. Um, however, um, we do think that in, in other parts of the world, um, um, ITA does not have a presence, and you have other um, competing companies, such as Everbread um, here in China. Um, there's another company that um, offers that service. So it's, it's really narrowed down to North America where Google is really solidifying their position, which I, 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 I think um, overall, um, I don't agree with the Justice Department. I, I, I think it's negative uh, for the industry. And um, what Google, we think, will do is um, slow the innovation of compelling online travel products by controlling too much of the value chain.
And I, I think, like I said, it's going to be a personal comment because my, my son and daughter are fully e, e educated, right? So they do their entire education online. They do it at their own pace. My daughter is faster than my son. Uh, but it works for both of them because they work at their own pace. And like one of the things that Matt said, it's going to be compelling. And both of them are compelled by interacting with a computer or with an iPad for that matter. And because it transcends all boundaries, they can be anywhere. So they could be traveling in person and they could still get the education. So that's one of the things that uh, we like about e -learning.
Can I just ask an, an, another uh, interesting one, just from your perspective? Um, this partnership market with uh, products that possibly have a brand connection with yours, uh, what, what's your uh, thoughts with that with regards to utilisation of technology as well? We're actually doing one right now, so with the Shangri-La Hotel where you stay, we're running a campaign in conjunction with Rim Blackberry. Because Rim Blackberry are bringing out a new handset designed for the business traveller. Shangri-La are marketing the same audience. And, you know, as a, marketing is long known that if I can put a, a, a brand representative, a brand ambassador holding my, my product, then, then that builds things like trust and that credibility. So I, I'm an avid believer that if you can put the right two products together, or the right set of products together, there's synergies and there's actually amplification of that brand value. Get the wrong match, and then you've got that uh, insight. Oh, there's no question that social media is here to say it's powerful. To what extent does social media displace traditional media, print, television, so forth? If you were an NGO and you had $100 to spend, how would you allocate among the various forms of media? $100 or $100,000? It doesn't matter. It's only a matter of experts. Look, uh, again, if I talk about social media and the impact of that on, on people consuming information, you can see that there's an evolution. And now we talk about citizen journalism, we talk about trusted sources, trusted communities. People will consume information from where they believe is most authentic. Now, traditionally we had newspapers and then we were quite selective of where we got you know, information from what newspaper. Social media is another channel. Now, a certain generation will never read a newspaper. It is my belief. A certain generation will consume digital content via an iPad or a tablet type device or a mobile device. That content being created isn't necessary for a paid journalist. I hope Ruben Murdoch isn't here, but citizen journalism is here to stay in the form of blogging, uh, in the form of uh, comments and reviews. The difference will be that the way you aggregate your trusted news sources will be different. So my personal view is that you will meet people you, you believe have a credibility uh, in terms of the content they create, and then you will aggregate that into a way that's meaningful and easy to consume. So where I'd spend my money today as an NGO, I'd be spending a lot more of it on digital than I would be on press or magazines. And to give you an idea, three or four years ago, 15% of budget was typically spent in digital. Today I'm working with companies that are spending 60, 70% in digital. Will it always, you know, it won't be 100% ever, I don't believe, but it's certainly going to be disproportionately higher uh, than it is today. I, I, I think one of the, the key things uh, to, to, to know, to, to, to kind of echo a little bit of what, what Matt talked about is, one of the greatest things about information technology is we can track and monitor everything. So that means you can tell if something's working or not working, as long as you have the right metrics. So what we try to encourage our partners to do, whether it's an NTO or whatever, whoever, um, is to be very clear about what are your specific objectives? What are you tracking or measuring? Is it first time visitors? Is it just general top of mind awareness? Maybe aided, unaided? Uh, what is it? Is it some sort of action? Is it, is, 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 is it a re registration or some, or some sort of engagement of, of intention? And, and, and the greatest thing about the internet is, and, and, um, um, you can say digital platforms, wireless, online, whatever it is, is you can track and monitor those. And, and what does that mean? Is you can utilize some of the strategies Matt has just highlighted, and, and you can try five, six, 20 different things um, so, if, so if you had $100, I would say you spend $5 testing, tracking, monitoring everything and, 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 and assume that you don't know anything. That's the key. And, and, and every single NTO is going to be different every, because depending on your engagement target. And, and you have to go in, you know, don't trust me, don't trust Matt and, and Vincent, any of us. Just go and test and monitor and track. Um, make sure you get that down though. Um, and then, and, and, and once you figure that out, and then the next 95 is going to be great. You can just uh, throw up because, because you're going to know what works. Um, and probably because this market is changing so quickly, you probably have to sit back after six months or a year and rethink the whole thing again. Um, but, 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 but that's the beauty of online. 
track and monitor, but it's also the challenge because it changes very quickly. And, and, and one thing that uh, we, we encourage marketers to do all the time. Sorry, Mike. I'm going to be the opposite because half my budget goes to traditional, right? So even though we run a digital platform, uh, we've got a partnership with one of the largest newspapers in Malaysia, and we'll find that we're getting very good traction out of newspaper yet in, in this day and age, right? But you're right. Both, both of them are right. It's, it depends on your market. Uh, our market just happens to be still very newspaper-centric. It doesn't work for Singapore as much. Um, and, and, and as we experiment and as we do new things, we have to assume that we don't know anything. Right? So a lot of the things that we did initially, we thought were right, were wrong. Right? For the first two months, first three months, we were learning all along the way and realized that um, actually newspaper worked better. Despite, despite uh, my own belief that uh, digital marketing works best, right? uh, it worked for that particular period. That's what worked. Uh, one of the things that we have also learned is that apart from social media, search engine marketing still plays a huge part in driving up numbers to our site. Uh, so while social media has very high page views per user, they don't drive as much traffic for us as, say, search engine marketing. And search engine marketing is also a different, it is in itself a whole different kettle of fish because targeting different markets, uh, you have to use different strategies. So one example that I always like to use is uh, if I want to market a place called Cameron Islands in Malaysia to just Singaporeans, I actually have to misspell the name Cameron Islands. I actually have to spell it Cameroon Islands. How many of you are here, here are from Singapore? Okay, right, so correct me if I'm wrong. A lot of Singaporeans refer to Cameron Islands as Cameroon Islands. No, not, not your son. Right, but guess what? It's, that is what yields results. So if I, sorry, if, if, if I run, run a hotel in, in Cameron Islands in Malaysia, I, if I run a digital marketing campaign, I should actually be spelled because the yields are four times higher. Sorry, just to say that quickly. Um, the other thing just to make note of, digital is a number of channels. So one we heard about social media, one we heard about search, we talked about media buying, we've talked about EDM, some people mentioned that before doing newsletters. Don't try and turn them all on at the same time. Different behaviours require different types of things. So for example, when someone's doing research, then you would typically use search, you know, search marketing because they're doing search engine marketing for research. Social media is not a research platform. Social media is a platform for echoing thoughts and beliefs about a destination, sharing ideas. EDM is a great channel for doing an email blast out with a specific agenda. So what I would say to you, when you think about using digital marketing, don't think it's one thing. Buying a banner on a website isn't digital marketing. It's simply one element of a digital program. And the other thing, every digital channel has a different objective, a different audience, and different measurement criteria. Don't try and use the same criteria for search as you would social, as you would EDM. So it's a very sophisticated discussion, but a lot of the marketers I speak to confuse it by saying, oh, I'll just use search, and then they'll think they've done digital marketing. It's multi-channel um, with its own life cycles in each of those channels. I think it's time to wrap up now, it's three o'clock. And I saw, but just in finish, I think a very important thing to note is that uh, we have talked about six major strategies that could change. Technology is a business enabler, it's not there just to use because it's technology. Uh, it should be tried to a trend uh, and brought through. So in that way, we go from the tourism industry to marketing to strategic forethought to, to get actions uh, that we discussed right at the beginning. Um, I think the three guys did a great job, so uh, can you give them a round of applause? Thank you.